If you never heard of the Aquarius computer, don't worry, you're not alone. This strange and fascinating machine, with its somewhat toy-like appearance, was produced by Mattel, the same company behind Barbie and Hot Wheels. With a name that evokes aquatic world, it has a short but incredibly interesting story. It was powered by a Z80A CPU running at 3.5 MHz with 4 KB of RAM and capable of offering colorful cartridge games. Hi everyone and welcome to my channel. Today I'm taking you to a journey through a piece of computing history, a bold attempt by a toy giant to break into the personal computer market. I'm talking about Mattel's Aquarius. Let's go back in the early 80s when home computing was just starting to transform our lives. Right in the middle of this revolution, an indisputed giant in the toy world, Mattel, famous for shaping the childhoods of millions with Barbie, Hot Wheels and epic battles from Master of the Universe, decided to take a quantum leap and venture into a territory far from its core business, which is the personal computer market. When the Aquarius was announced in 1983, it was met with a mix of surprise and curiosity. Backed with its powerful brand and keen understanding of the consumer desires, Mattel aimed to democratize computing, making it accessible to that group of consumers who were intrigued by this new technological frontier, but intimidated by the complexity and the costs of existing systems. The Aquarius was meant to be a bridge between the world of toys and computing, a tool for playful learning and interactive entertainment for the whole family. To tackle this, Mattel took some pragmatic choices, outsourcing hardware and software development. The partnership with Radofin Electronics, a Hong Kong company known for producing electronics at competitive prices, was key for keeping the Aquarius production costs low. While this move allowed Mattel to enter the market quickly, it also led to a series of unavoidable technical compromises that would seal the machine's fate. Despite the initial enthusiasm and promises of a future filled with digital fun, the Aquarius adventure turned out to be pretty short-lived, because it was released in an increasingly saturated and competitive market. With technically superior rivals, the Aquarius struggled to win over the hearts and the wallets of consumers. Its rise and fall was with, production ended the same year it started in some markets, leaving behind an echo of what-ifs and also a small yet fascinating chapter in the story of failed attempts to expand and the frontiers of personal computing. Now let's dive into the beating heart, or rather the integrated circuits that brought the Aquarius to life. The membrane keyboard, one of the most distinctive features of the Aquarius, is a compromise between cost and durability. Its resistance to dust and spills made it potentially suitable for households with small children, however the lack of tactile feedback and the swallow key travel made typing inaccurate and tiring during longer sessions. Now let's break down its internal structure to understand how keyboard detention worked. Ideally, removing its plastic shell, we can peer into the electronic architecture that defined both its capabilities and its limitation. At the center of it all sat the Xilux Z80A microprocessor, an 8-bit CPU that coordinates all system operations, while the RAM, the crucial temporary workspace for running programs, was just limited to 4 kilobytes. And to put that in perspective, a low-resolution JPEG image today takes up hundreds of times more space. This tiny amount of memory implemented using fast but expensive SRAM chips placed strict limitations on the size and complexity of the software and the games the Aquarius could handle. Programmers had to be true masters of code optimization to make their creations fit into such a small space. Graphics display management was handled by a dedicated chip. This component is the true architect of the video signal sent to the monitor or the TV, orchestrating the arrangement of pixels on the screen to create text and graphics. The standard resolution was 40 columns for 24 rows, a fairly basic format even for the era. The 16-color palette offers some degree of visual flexibility, but limitations in sprite handling and graphics plans meant that not all colors could be displayed simultaneously in every mode. The Aquarius audio capabilities were frankly bare bones. Unlike many of its contemporaries, the feature that dedicated audio chip capable of producing complex music and rich sound effects, the Aquarius mainly relied on its internal speaker, which was driven directly by the CPU. This resulted in a limited range audio output, so simple beeps and short monophonic sound effects. 
Communication with the outside world relied on a set of functional but basic ports, the ROM cartridge slot, which was the main access point for software and games, the serial port for connecting an external cassette recorder, a lifeline for loading and saving data, and RF outputs, which ensured compatibility with most TVs and monitors of the time. From a technical standpoint, cartridges contained read-only memory chips, pre-programmed with the games or applications code. This system eliminated the loading times typical of magnetic media, but it also limited software size to the available ROM chips capability and made production and distribution more expensive than cassettes. And I also wanted to say thank you for today's sponsor, PCBWay, which offer custom PCB services, assembly, injection molding, 3D printing, and many other features you can explore on their website. Whether you're building something simple or complex, you can customize every detail of the board, from the size to the color of the traces. And their website also hosts a great community full of retro-inspired projects, which I often check out for inspiration. So if you're interested, I'll leave a link in the description below Hello, and now let's get back to the Aquarius. A key component of the Aquarius ecosystem was its cassette recorder, and it wasn't just a standard tape deck, but it was a unit specifically engineered by Mattel to optimize the transfer of digital data onto magnetic tape. Even so, the loading and saving process was notoriously slow and error prone, often requiring multiple attempts and a good deal of patience from the user. Among the various games available for Aquarius, let's take Burger Time, where the characters, even though they were made of polygons, remained surprisingly recognizable. The gameplay, while stripped of the original's fluidity and details, still retains its core formula of path-based strategy and frantic enemy evasion. The audio, limited to a series of beeps and basic sound effects, nonetheless tries to complement its on-screen action. In Throne, Deadly Discs, the adaptation of the iconic science fiction movie, you can see the effort to recreate the intense disc-throwing battles, and the low resolution makes the characters less detailed, but the action remains understandable, and the use of 16 colors tries to adapt to the environments and helps distinguish the various interactive elements. Many Aquarius games were based on arcade games or titles from other systems. This was a common way to attract people who already liked or knew those games, Games, but unfortunately, the limited hardware make it hard to copy the original experience exactly, and Mattel hoped that the game library would be the main reason people would buy the Aquarius, but unfortunately, the difference between the real experience with the Aquarius and what people expected from big names like Mattel would probably cause its weak success on the market. As mentioned before, figuring out exactly who created the Aquarius is quite difficult, this because many of the work was done through outside contract in outsourcing deals like the one with Radofin Electronics, so the name of the engineers and the programmers remain hidden inside the companies involved. Still, we can make some guesses based on the information we do have. Radofin Electronics definitely played a key role in creating the Aquarius hardware. Their engineering team were mostly likely in charge of designing the circuit boards, picking the electronic parts, keeping production costs low, and putting together both the computer and its cassette recorder. The marketing team, in particular, was in charge of crafting the message that aimed to present the Aquarius as a fun and affordable computer for the whole family. And when it comes to software and game development, things are even less clear. Sometimes Titles may have been made by internal teams on Mattel, while others were commissioned to independent software companies, but finding out the specific names of those developers is often very difficult, since game credits on cartridges were very rare. The limited expandability of the Aquarius was another major issue. The only real expansion module, which added a full alphanumeric keyboard and increased RAM to 32 kilobytes, came to the market too late to change its page. This lack of upgrade and customization options kept the Aquarius from evolving and competing with more flexible systems that offer floppy drive support, serial and parallel ports, and other peripherals. Positioning the Aquarius as a low-cost family computer put it in direct competition with other entry-level machines of the time, like the Atari 400, the ZX Spectrum and the VIC-20. But unfortunately, while the Aquarius had a competitive price, its lower specs and also the membrane's keyboard quality didn't always make it the most attractive choice for the informed buyers. Looking at the promotional materials, you can see how Mattel tried to use its strong brand in the toy industry to present the Aquarius as a natural extension of home entertainment. 
Despite its very short and unlucky time on the personal computer market, the Mattel Aquarius holds a unique and fascinating place in the retro computing history, its bold vision of bringing computing into every home combined with its technical quirks and connection with a toy industry giant like Mattel makes it a subject of interest and curiosity for enthusiasts. Its commercial failure can be traced to a mix of factors, for example hardware limitations, a software library that didn't always meet the expectations, the membrane keyboard and also a strong competition. Still, these quirks, combined with its unexpected origins, give it a certain retro charm. The Aquarius stands as a bold, though unsuccessful, attempt to unconventional company to enter the computing world, leaving behind a legacy more rooted in historical curiosity than technological innovation. As always, I hope you liked this video, let me know in the comments what you think and if you already knew the Aquarius. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and to my Patreon page and see ya in the next video. Bye!